a whole new generation of Christians are emerging on the American scene. They tend to be young people, not old people like myself. And they are saying, we believe the doctrines that were taught by the Apostle Paul, but we feel that the church has failed to embrace the lifestyle prescribed by Jesus of Nazareth, a life of simplicity and sacrifice, especially on behalf of the poor and the oppressed of the world. We need a church that promotes red letter Christianity. If that's your kind of thinking, you're gonna love this show because that's what we're about. We're about talking and preaching the red letters of the Bible. This is a show that is meant for you. Hi there, you're watching Red Letter Christianity, and I'm Shane Claiborne, this is Tony Campoa, we're your hosts, and on this show, we talk about the stuff that Jesus said, and the stuff that Jesus lived, and we're asking ourselves, what if he really meant it, and what would our lives look like if we lived it out? So today, we, 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 we've got a great guest, arguably one of the most uh, influential church leaders, writers, and speakers in, in North America. In the world friend, right now. A good friend of both of ours, Brian McLaren. And uh, w one of the things that we're, we're talking about today with Brian is, is actually the, the conflict in the Middle East, and, and the, particularly in Israel and Palestine. And, and what I love about Jesus is not only did he walk through that land, but the things that he's teaching about are the real stuff of the world he's living in. I mean, he's not just talking about kind of pie in the sky ideas, but he's talking about unjust judges and terrible leaders and day laborers and disparity between the rich and the poor. And so when we think of what Jesus taught and bring it into the world that we live in now, this is a really critical question. And uh, Brian makes a big point out of the fact that Jesus let the Jewish people in his day know that their God loved the Samaritans and the uh, Canaanites and the, uh, all those tribes around them just as much as he loved them. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he wanted to uh, highlight what it meant to be a good person in the eyes of God, he holds up the Good Samaritan, which must have shocked people in that day. Mm -hmm. um, Brian will not only talk about the Middle East, but he's got a, a broken heart over what's happening to people in Africa, mm -hmm. in Latin America. So this ought to be a really hot program, particularly for young people. So often young people get so wrapped up in their own little world mm. that they don't lift their eyes beyond that little world to the world that lies beyond. Mm. And uh, we're all affected because we live in an urban village. Uh, we may live in a city in the United States or in a rural community in the United States, but the global village, it's all been compact. And he's, I got to say, he's, he's, one of the more controversial speakers of our time. Mm. So uh, while I hold the line for orthodoxy, um, he's in so many ways more orthodox than I am mm. because he takes the words of Jesus more seriously than most people I know, and perhaps even more than you know. Yeah, and I, I got the chance to go over to Israel and Palestine and walk through the Holy Land with Brian, and, and as we're absorbing it, you just, you can't help but think this this land, which is so central in all the scriptures, you read about these little towns like Capernaum, you know, which was like 400 people, and we walked through that town. But you see this holy land, and so many of the things happening there are so unholy. Yeah. And, and one of the folks there, there said, this is the most sophisticated apartheid system, segregation system that our world has ever seen. Jimmy Carter suggests that in a book. He, he doesn't say it is an apartheid world, but he says it's certainly heading in that direction. Uh, the thing that I love about this guy is he makes us aware that the Bible speaks every bit as much about justice mm. as it does about love. We all know that the Bible talks about love, but it talks about justice. As a matter of fact, he makes it clear that justice is nothing more than love translated into social policy. Mm. So uh, I'm looking forward to our little conversation with one of the great spokespersons of our time, Brian McLaren. Welcome back to Red Letter Christianity. We're here with Brian McLaren, uh, a good friend of ours and uh, someone who has influenced so much of 
the Christian conversation in our world today, and uh, plus a really good friend. Good to see you. Hey, man. great to be with you. Shake my hand, too. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm the older generation, and I know you want to connect with the younger generation. Well, but I, we have meaning, too. I'm right in between there, okay. and uh, I'm imitating your hairstyle. Right, there you are. So, uh, <laughs> there you go. That's right. Well, tell, t I think before we get to all the issues uh, that are going on today, uh, I, tell us a little of your your story. Sure. I mean, you guys were just singing this song that yeah. I hadn't. I, I've never even heard it. Well, so like, this guy, before he ever became this world-renowned theologian, uh, especially addressing issues that young people are concerned about, uh, was playing a guitar for youth groups. I mean, uh, what was it? Young Life, Youth for Christ, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that he was into all of that kind of stuff. And you were like the hero of every well, teenage girl no, no, in those no. days. And now look at you. Yeah, let's, let's not go into that. Yeah. But uh, How did you get from there to well, where you are? I, I grew up in the church uh, and kind of was on my way out, to tell you the truth, in my teenage years. And then I had a very dramatic encounter with the Lord that turned my life around. And um, that was right when the Jesus movement was hitting in the early 70s. And so a lot of these young people who are watching the show don't even know about the Jesus yeah. movement. Say just a little bit sure. about that. Well, as the kind of the countercultural movement, the hippie movement was really breaking out in uh, the United States. I've heard of him. Uh, you've heard of that, too. Yeah. <laughs> Ever heard of the 1960s anyway. Um, but uh, a, a very powerful spiritual movement happened as well. And lots of folks from the counterculture were con confronted with Jesus, not as a straight-laced guy in the establishment, but as somebody who really turned over the tables. And, and, um, and so it was a very dynamic time. And it not only represented many people from the outside coming into the church, but that then helped a lot of people in the church look outside in a very exciting uh, time. So I was, uh, yeah, I was a guitar player and a worship leader and a songwriter and- And a hippie? Uh, uh, that was, I, I actually had hair back then. <laughs> Did you have long hair? I had long hair and oh a long beard goodness, and all the rest. Come to that. I, I used it There's all up. There's hope for you. There's hope for you. I used it all up uh, once. But uh, uh, then, uh, I, and I never thought I'd be a pastor or anything like that. I, I wanted to be an t English teacher. So I was in university studying to be a college English teacher. Uh, and I got married. My wife and I started a little fellowship group in our home. Uh, soon it was 20 people and then 40 people. And eventually I left teaching to become a pastor. We ended up starting a little church. And I pastored. It wasn't such a little church when I visited there. Well, it, it, over time, it started in our living room. And over time, it grew to several hundred people. And, and so I ended up pastoring that church for 24 years. Uh -huh. And um, during that time, I, I, you know, something happens when you preach the Bible every week you actually read it and you encounter the red letters. And, it, and I went through an experience mm. very much like uh, both of you where I, I suddenly had to confront what Jesus actually said. And that started, it started shaking me up and I ended up doing some writing. And uh, s just almost uh, six years ago, I left the pastorate to devote full time to writing. You wrote a book that really uh, exploded on the scene, uh, a new t kind of Christian. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and uh, that kind of, rescued you from obscurity and <laughs> kind of made you a world-renowned speaker because people all over the world read that book. Well, it, it was, that was a funny experience because that book came out of my own struggle and mm. questioning. And I remember when I wrote the book, I thought, I'm going to lose all my friends when this book comes out. Yeah. But what I found was thousands and thousands of new friends of other people who were thinking, I'm the only person with these questions. I'm the only person who feels like something in the kind of Christian world isn't quite right. And as we started to find each other, uh, exciting conversations opened up, and, and that's... And here you are. And yeah, it's been still going so on today. You haven't even uh, mentioned kind of the phrase of the word emerging church, but is that, is that language that you are using, or that's, is it even language that's helpful now? Yeah. Or? Well, you know, it, uh, that's a big, I, I wonder whether our listeners know that there's this movement called the Emerging yeah. Church. And I guess the key leader right now is Tony Jones. I yeah. guess he would be the spokesperson, but it's worldwide now, the Emerging Church movement. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm of, uh, I, I, I see this in a lot of different ways because I, I've traveled in something like 40 countries uh, in, in the last several years. And what you see around the world is independent little sparks that are just coming up mm. of, of people asking the same kind of questions. And here in the United States, one of the names that that conversation has happened under has been this word emerging or emergent. 
And um, whenever people start asking questions, some people are, are, are so happy. Oh, good, we're getting some new issues on the table. Okay. The kind of things that you guys love to talk about in this show. Other people are, oh, that's, that's too controversial. Let's try to tap that down a little bit. So whenever you open up these questions, there's some controversy involved with it. Some people think it goes too far. Some people think it doesn't go far enough. But uh, I've been very excited to be part of these conversations that are asking important questions about who Jesus is today, what, does his, what do his words have to say to us today, what does it mean for authentic Christian identity today? And so as you, as, as you kind of look at what's happening in the world right now and what's happening in the church, what are, what are maybe a couple of the, the most urgent questions you think mm -hmm. we need to be asking? Oh, three uh, come up again and again for me. Uh, I wrote a book a couple of years ago called Everything Must Change, and, and I just, that's writing that book, I saw the three big questions are the planet, poverty, and peace. The planet, what does our faith, what does our commitment to Jesus Christ say to us about our responsibility to care for God's world? You know, the environment. The environment. So few people realize there's all those chapters in the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, parts of the Bible a lot of people skip over, that are about taking care of the land. Uh, being respectful to living creatures. This is part of our biblical heritage. A of course, we see it in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, uh, Jesus refers to the birds of the air, the flowers of the field. God cares for them. So recovering- The parables are like gardening stories oh, about them. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. So, so that's the first one. The first one is the planet. planet. The second one is poverty. Mm -hmm. This huge and growing gap between the rich and the poor. All of us have traveled a lot and we know what it's like to walk in, in a slum where you're walking in human excrement and you're around children who barely have any clothes, never have had any health care. Uh, and you, when you take seriously what we believe, that God knows the name of every one of those children, God loves every one of those children, that gap between rich and poor is unacceptable. And, and what, it's getting worse. Oh, it, mm. it, it, it is. I mean, the numbers are staggering in, in our lifetime. Yeah. It has multiplied. Um, it, it, 45 million people have fallen below the poverty level in the last 10 years. Yeah. They were middle class and they've dropped down to the poverty level as this gap increases. Yeah. And there are, what, 1,500 verses in the scriptures, some say 2,000 verses, that call upon us to respond to the poor and that those who read the Bible don't see it is amazing to oh, me. Oh, it, it's, well, it's tragic. It, mm. it, and I think it's, it's very dishonoring to God, to the God who loves the poor. So that poverty is the second one. And then the third one's peace. Uh, and peace is especially big issue because in today's world, religious people are very often the first ones to talk about shooting gun, guns or dropping bombs. And I, I hate to say it, but we have to say it. There are an awful lot of Christians who will be the first to raise their hand saying, should we go to war? In spite of everything Jesus said. Jesus said, of, blessed are the peacemakers, yeah. uh, love your enemies. And we have a bumper sticker that people write to us for that says, when Jesus said, love your enemies, he probably meant we shouldn't kill them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good statement. I mean, oh. and people say, oh, snicker at it and say, it's not practical. And I always like those who say, the question is not whether or not it's practical. <laughs> the question is, are we going to be faithful to what Jesus taught us? Look, the only people who will say it's not practical are the people with the bombs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the people who are having the bombs fall on them. They see the impracticality of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the... I think you could argue as much as the other thing that it's not practical to continue to spend $250,000 a minute on war while the country goes bankrupt. I mean, and, here in America, for American Christians, if we took seriously the red letters of Jesus and we took seriously his call to be peacemakers, you know, it would make a huge difference in what happens not only in America, but in our world. You've been to Africa. Uh, now, could you tell me a little bit about your experiences there? Well, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time in Africa in recent years, uh, from South Africa up to East Africa. And um, one of the most meaningful things in my life, really, has been an opportunity to be involved with the poorest of the poorest of the poor that I've ever met. You know, in Africa, you can be in poor, ur with or poor urban people and two hours later be with incredibly poor rural people. A lot of people don't realize that 
most of Africa's poverty is still rural poverty. And one of the big challenges of this century will be, can we help rural people experience a better life so that they don't all migrate to slums where all, so much of their misery will be concentrated? And so much of our missionary work has only brought part of the gospel. We've told people about Jesus and about his salvation through the cross. But Jesus not only calls us to believe in him, but he calls us to be disciples and to live out his teachings. And whoever hears my words and lives them out shall be like a house built on a rock. Mm -hmm. We need people who have good foundations in Christ. But if uh, you look at Africa, where do you see the church working and what do you think we ought to be well, doing? I'm going to say a couple of things that a lot of people won't hear here in the United States, but this is true. The young people will hear it. There are churches exploding in Africa that are making the ministers incredibly rich. Yeah. And what they end up being, it's a kind of it's larceny. It's a prosperity gospel, isn't it's it? It's a kind of spiritual larceny yeah. where yeah. pastors convince people to give money to them, promising them they'll be blessed. The people go on living in poverty. The pastors get Rolexes and expensive suits and fly around in jet planes. And uh, I'll tell you something. Uh, there won't be a second and third generation prosperity gospel of that sort in Africa because the younger kids grow up and mm -hmm. they, when they think of church, they think of, they think of what kept their parents uh, under the heel of poverty. I, I think about a friend of mine, wonderful uh, fellow from Burundi, little tiny country about the same size as Maryland in East Africa. Uh, Claude's father was a preacher. He grew up going to church five times a week. And he told me when he was a teenager, he looked and he said, you know, my country is the third poorest country in the world. My country has been racked by genocide, the same kind of genocide as happened in Rwanda. And he looked and he said, and at church, all we ever talk about is don't smoke, don't cuss, don't gamble, don't drink, and go to heaven when you die. We never say anything about genocide. We never say anything about tribal conflict, and we never say anything about poverty. Mm. He, he just said this religion doesn't, isn't making a difference in what really counts in this world. And he turned away from the faith. Mm. Uh, some years later, he came back to Christ and rediscovered that Jesus' gospel was the gospel of the coming of the reign or kingdom or, or commonwealth of God, mm. and that it had everything to do with, uh, with the real problems of this world. And now he represents a growing movement in Africa of Christians who have a... a, a a three-dimensional understanding of the gospel. It's not just an escape route. It's not an evacuation plan for heaven. It's an incarnation plan. It's a transformation plan about God making a difference in this world. When, whenever they talk about that prosperity theology, they always take Old Testament passages, yeah. uh, you know, but they don't deal with Jesus and those red letters uh, where, where Jesus says, uh, you know, give your money to the poor. Yeah. Uh, take up the cross and mm -hmm. follow me. Um, it's not words of Jesus, but in 1 John 3, 17 and 18, if you have this world's goods and you know of people who are in need and you keep what you have while they suffer, yeah. how can you say I have the love of God in my heart? And I wonder about these multi-millionaire preachers who are fleecing their congregations and they watch their own people in dire poverty. They have this world's goods and they're not sharing what they have with those who are in need in their own communities. It scares me. Yeah. And it's unbiblical, it's unchristian, and we need to speak out as you are doing so well on this show. Well, uh, it, it, and the exciting thing is when people rediscover Jesus, it liberates both the rich and the poor. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it dehumanizes rich people to only live selfish, small, sure. self-centered yeah. lives. And, and of course, it dehumanizes poor people when the rich man lives in the palace and Lazarus is in the gutter out mm -hmm. front. Remember this, young people. You're following a Jesus who said it's harder for a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Mm -hmm. Now, you've been to Palestine with this guy. Well, uh, could you talk about that? Almost two years ago, you sent me an email mm -hmm. uh, that said, let's go to the Middle East together. Have you, and and uh, my, my first thought was, that sounds like fun. You know, walk to places where Jesus walked and see the sea of Galilee. But you Galilee. guys move so fast, you probably sing to him, I ran to G today where <laughs> Jesus ran. <laughs> but but uh, then you said, we'll, we'll do that. But, but uh, just as important as that is what's happening there right now. And uh, this is one of the most urgent issues in our world today. 
And uh, after going together this past year, I'm, I'm convinced that that's true. That, yeah. that, that uh, uh, t tell, tell us a little bit of what fueled that fire inside of you and convinced you that mm -hmm. this is one of the biggest issues in our world. Okay, well, uh, a lot of Americans, and especially American Christians, don't understand uh, the, the whole picture of what's going on there. Uh, we Christians, I think rightly, feel ashamed about the history of anti-Semitism that goes back, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years in Christian history. And, and it's an ugly subject that we don't even like to bring up. But the truth is, major sectors of the Christian faith were anti-Semitic, were prejudiced against Jewish people. Yeah. Horrible things were done. And we all know how well, that... Hitler used the Bible. Yeah. We know that, it, yeah. it, that, that the Holocaust in many ways was the, was the culmination of it. Right. But for hundreds of years before that, there were periodic, mm -hmm. we would call them ethnic cleansings, yeah. uh, ga gang fights against Jewish people. And it's a horrible part of Christian history that we need to pay attention to. Um, uh, but I think after the Holocaust, a lot of Christians started to realize we've been so bad to the Jews mm -hmm. and we have to make to try to make that right. And so we've had a, a very good and generous impulse to try to protect the Jewish people in the home in the homeland of Israel. Unfortunately, what we didn't realize is to give the Jewish people a homeland meant we displaced thousands and thousands of the people who lived there. Uh, uh, really, the story is a lot like what happened here in the United States. The native peoples, the Indians, Nor Native Americans lived here. And then other people came seeking religious liberty. That's mm -hmm. our pilgrim story. And we didn't, we often don't pay attention to the way that we displace the native peoples here. Horrible atrocities. Really, the word genocide is not, uh, mm -hmm. is, is not an exaggeration for, for what happened. And uh, both in North America and in South America. Well, something like that has happened. And Palestinian people were herded into refugee camps, a lot like our reservations. And, uh, and many of them were ripped out of their homes. And, and uh, now many of them live under ocu occupation. And so what we... Like one of the places we went, they had all of the, the keys to their homes on the wall, praying that one day they'd be able to go back. That's right. And, and, and you know, people here, we don't hear those stories enough. Uh, especially our, in, in Christian circles, because we, w I think we're in many ways still trying to make up for the horrible atrocities that Christians did against Jews. Mm. And in that way, we're doing something good. We're being generous and trying to make right or wrong toward our Jewish neighbors. But the unintended consequence now is that we're not paying attention to atrocities done against Palestinians. And a lot of Christians don't know this, but many Palestinians are Christian yeah. and many are Muslim. Yeah. I, I heard it said that there's more Palestinian Christians than there are Israeli national Christians. Yeah. But, but that's beside, the, the fact is that when, you, when you're born again, you have a new identity that these borders are, they, they, they don't matter as much as that every person is made in the image of God and every person has infinite dignity. And, and God loves every Palestinian, every Muslim, as much as he loves every Jewish person and every Christian. His love is infinite for every human being. And we got to make that clear. He doesn't love some people more yeah. than he loves others. He loves us all infinitely, intensely, and forever. Tony, I, I mean, that is so, such a simple statement. We yeah. sing it when we're children. Jesus loves the little children mm -hmm. of the world. All the little children, red and yellow, black and white, Israeli, Palestinian, mm -hmm. Christian, Muslim, they all are precious in God's sight. So one of the reasons that, mm -hmm. Shane, that I wanted uh, to go on that trip and bring you and some others along is if we could meet Palestinian children and adults, and we met a lot, we met- Stayed in their homes. We yeah. stayed in their homes. We met Palestinians, Tony, who ha had been tortured in prison. Yep. And they didn't do anything wrong. Yeah. They just were in the wrong place at the wrong time, got rounded up and thrown in prison. If you young people go to the Holy Land, just don't take the tour that the Jewish tour guides take you on. Go into uh, the West Bank, go to Bethlehem Bible College, solid evangelical, I would even say fundamentalist school, mm -hmm. and listen to the stories of your Christian brothers and sisters in that school. I, I guess we could go on a long time with this guy because he's got a lot to say, but our time is up and we want to thank you for giving us an impassioned, you, you speak soft, but you carry a big stick like Theodore Roosevelt. 
and you've pounded us all on the head a little bit today, and thank God for that. Well, thanks, thanks for being so much for having me. Thanks. For God bless you. Welcome back to Red Letter Christianity, a program committed to getting you to take the words of Jesus as outlined in the Red Letters of the Bible seriously. Uh, listen, uh, this guy really pricks our conscience. Mm. I mean, uh, he makes us aware of things that we would rather not be aware of. Mm. Uh, he upsets me. I, I wrote a book with him. It's called Adventures in Missing the Point. Mm. And even in that book, we missed some of the key issues. We didn't deal with the environment at all in that book. But his three points were, again, the young people are asking questions about what's happening to the planet, you know, what's happening uh, to poverty, and what's happening to peace. Mm -hmm. And how does the church figure into all of these? Unfortunately, Gandhi had it right when he said, everybody knows what Jesus taught, except for Christians. Mm -hmm. People will find him controversial, but I want to ask them one simple question if they do. What did he say that Jesus would contradict? Mm. That's a good question to ask before you do your criticizing. Uh, it's, you know, I've heard you say, Tony, uh, it, it's not the parts of the Bible that I don't understand that disturb me. It's the parts of the Bible I do understand yeah. that disturb me. And, and the, one of the scriptures that uh, uh, Brian mentioned just briefly as he's talking, to ch kind of challenging the prosperity gospel and challenging the... Uh, wall building. You mentioned the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And th this is a, an, an incredible story where Jesus talks about a guy that's built his own wall and his gated neighborhood and he's living in luxury while folks are suffering right outside of his gate, right on the other side. Jesus' story. And uh, they die and the, the, the poor man who's given the name Lazarus is rescued and next to God. The rich man is separated from God. And it's a heartbreaking story. But what strikes me is that as you read the story, you discover that, that the rich man was a religious guy. He calls Abraham father. He knows the prophets. He knows the scripture. And yet his religion did nothing to tear down the wall between himself and the poor man outside of his gate. And, and uh, as you read that story, we can see ourselves in it. Yes. You know, and you can see the situation I in the Middle myself. East. You can see the wall between the U.S. and Mexico. All the ways, whatever things, that, like they enclose us and they, they lock us in. And the irony is that not only would the, the poor man have been better off if the gate were torn down, but so would the rich man yeah. because he locked himself in a life that was robbed of compassion, robbed of love. And that wall not only separated him from the poor, but it separated him from God. I hope uh, our uh, listeners go out and get some of McLaren's books. Uh, you know, Brian McLaren has written some fantastic books and he yeah. writes in a way that young people really can get hold of, particularly that book that made him famous, namely A New Kind of Christian. He also has this book, Everything Has to Change, which is worth reading. It's really a good book because young people see it. The world has to change. The church has to change if it's going to survive into the 21st century. So I'm glad you listened and I'm glad you heard and I'm glad you saw Brian McLaren. Uh, he looks like a middle-aged guy. He really speaks like a young kid who belongs to your generation. Thanks, and stay with us next week. We're going to talk to more interesting people who are red-letter Christians.